Afrocentric ones. This is African Anecdotes TV and I am back with another book review and this time we are looking at a book called Facing Mount Kenya, The Tribal Life of the Kikuyu People. This book was written by Jomo Kenyatta who happens to be the first president of the Republic of Kenya and he was from the Kikuyu tribe and I happen to be from the Kikuyu tribe and so when I came across this book I thought hey I would like to learn more about our people and as it so happens I'm just going to be sharing some of the highlights uh, you know some of the things that really just jumped out at me for my fellow Kikuyu people and well the whole African family at large so let's go so the author begins by saying this in due course i have passed three stages of eldership and this has enabled me to participate in councils of elders and to learn their procedures in various parts of the Gekuyu country as a member of the warrior class i not only have a practical knowledge of the Gekuyu methods of warfare but have lived in the maasai country at a place near ngare narok where I came in close contact with Maasai military methods and learned much about them and have also visited many other tribes. According to the tribal legend, we are told that in the beginning of things when mankind started to populate the earth, the man Gikoyo, the founder of the tribe, was called by Ngai and was given as his share the land with ravines, the rivers, the forests, the game, and all the gifts that the Lord of nature bestowed on mankind. At the same time, Guy made a big mountain which he called Kirinyaga, Mount Kenya, as his resting place when on inspection tour and as a sign of his wonders. He then took the man Gikoyo to the top of the mountain of mystery and showed him the beauty of the country that Guy had given him. Before they parted, Guy told Gikoyo that whenever he was in need, he should make a sacrifice and raise his hands towards Kirinyaga and the Lord of Nature will come to his assistance. God also provided Gikoyo with a wife called Mombi. Mombi means creator. And they had nine daughters and no sons. Gikoyo was very disturbed at not having a male heir and he complained to Guy. He was advised to sacrifice one lamb and one kid and a huge fig tree and to burn the meat as a sacrifice to Guy. And on doing so, nine young men appeared and greeted him warmly. After a short time, the young men married Gikoyo's nine daughters and they formed Bari Ya Mombi, Mombi's family group and hence the whole Kikuyu tribe came about as a result of that. Polygamy is a part or was a part of the Kikuyu community and the wives addressed one another as Moiro Akwa, my partner or co-wife. The author says each wife is materially almost independent of the other. The head wife has no superior authority over the rest, but she is only respected for her seniority in age, providing that she lives up to it. Her main official duty in the homestead is to take a leading part in the religious and other ceremonies performed in the home. If a man dies without a male child, his family group comes to an end. This is one thing that the Gekoyo people fear dreadfully and it can be said to be one of the factors behind the polygamous system of marriage. There is no doubt that perpetuation of family or kinship group is the main principle of every Gekoyo marriage. In the forests, there lived a race of people called Gumba Pygmy who were engaged in hunting they were very short and strong. Their homes were built underground. They were shy and did not like to mix freely with the strangers. To avoid meeting other people, they dug tunnels, connecting different sections 
of their underground villages. As soon as they saw a stranger, they ran into the tunnels which were cunningly concealed. Then they would run quickly underground and reappear at the other end. The Gekoi were very much astonished for they thought that these people had magic of opening the earth and disappearing therein at will. There were also the Ndorobo who established friendly relations with the Gekoyo and as the people continued to move southwards, land transactions started between the two tribes who lived side by side. The Ndorobo were not interested in cultivating the land. Their main occupation was hunting and collecting wild honey in the forests. Apart from land transactions they traded with the Gekoyo, they sold by butter, their honey, and skins of animals to the Gekoyo, who in turn gave the Dorobo grains, yams, sugar canes, bananas, and other fruits of the soil. The author continues, When a man wanted to buy another man's land, he would brew a small beer and take it to the landowner in the same way as if he was proposing marriage to his daughter. They would then agree. When they agreed about the price of the land, they would fix a date and invite the elders of the district to be present as ceremonial witnesses. According to the Gikoyo system of land tenure, no man could claim absolute ownership of any land unless he or his ancestors have gone through the ceremony of marking the boundary which was the Gekoyo form of title deed. The boundary trees and lilies so ceremonially planted were highly respected by the people. They were well looked after and preserved. The history connected with such lands was passed from one generation to another. No man dared to remove his neighbor's boundary mark for fear of his neighbor's curses and out of respect for him. But in case there was a big dispute, especially where a fire had destroyed boundary marks, a full council of elders was called to replant the trees and the lilies. The author continues, The chief occupation among the Rukoyo are agriculture and the rearing of livestock such as cattle, sheep and goats. Each family, that is a man, his wife or wife, and their children constitute an economic unit. This is controlled and strengthened by the system of division of labor according to sex, from the homestead to the fields and to the tending of the domestic animals. Every sphere of activity is clearly and systematically defined. The entire housework naturally falls within the sphere of women's activities they cook, bring water from the rivers, they wash utensils, they fetch firewood from the forest or bush. They also perform the task of carrying the loads on their backs. According to the tribal customs which govern the division of labor, no Kikuyu man would dare to indulge in any of these activities except in a case of emergency or else. He would scandalize the women and it would be difficult for such a man to get any girl to marry him. He would be given a nickname, something like Nosy Parker. Women are afraid of a man of this character for they say that if he could perform women's work, what is the use of getting married for how can a wife and husband be doing the same thing at the same time? Apart from being the display of wealth, cattle play a part in the economic life of the people. To start with, cow's milk is used for babies by those who can afford it. The milk is very little used in the Gekoyo diet except by those who own a number of cows. Hides are used for various purposes, for bedding, making sandals and straps, for tying and carrying firewood and other loads. As a source of meat, or butter supply, cattle play a very small part. Cows are never killed for food except at a time of famine. But bulls and oxen are now and again slaughtered for occasional meat feasts. And this is regarded as luxurious and only practiced by well-to-do 
persons sheep and goats unlike cattle are used for various religious sacrifices and purifications they are the chief means of supplying the people with meat while the skins are used as articles of clothing finally without a sheep or a goat a man cannot get a wife for it is sheep and goats that are given as ratio marriage insurances if a man has cash money and he wants to get married he must in the first place buy cattle or sheep and goods because the parents of the wife to be will not accept cash money as raw ratio to them coins have very little meaning and have no religious or sentimental associations within the kikuyu custom the author continues talking about the man's living quarters or the man's hut the man's hut unlike that of the woman is very simple it has only one partition and sometimes none at all. When there is one, it is used to divide the bedstead from the fireplace. The rest of the hut is left open. This is to provide a large sitting place for the family and their visitors. For the man's hut is used for general purposes, whereas the woman's hut is strictly used for her private purposes and family matters. I proceed to describe categorically the type of weapons which are used by the Kikuyu today. The most important weapons are spears, swords, bows and arrows, shields, a variety of clubs, and slings. After a boy has passed the initiation ceremony which gives him the status of a warrior, it is the duty of his father to supply him with necessary weapons. For without this, he cannot command the respect of his fellow warriors. In the whole of the Gekoyo country, there are only four different kinds of musical instruments, namely the drum, the large rattle, the small rattle, and the flute. Each of these is used on a separate occasion. In addition to the above list, we can mention that there are various kinds of horns which are sounded for ceremonial purposes. These can hardly be described as musical instruments, but we can put them in the same category as bangles. Education begins at the time of birth and ends with death, the author says. The child has to pass various stages of age groupings with a system of education defined for every status in life. The parents take the responsibility of educating their children until they reach the stage of tribal education. They aim at instilling into the children what the Gekoyo called Otari wa Mushi, namely educating the children in the family and clan tradition. Apart from the system of schools which has been introduced by the Europeans, there is no special school building in the Gekoyo sense of the word. The homestead is the school. When the child is able to speak, he can answer many questions which are, which are asked gently and naturally to test how much he has learned. Such questions might be, what is your name? Who is your father? What is his age group? What is the name of your grandfather? What about your great grandfather? Why were they given such and such names for their age groups? This type of question goes back for several generations and small children are able to answer freely without any effort or strain on their part. In this way, the history and traditions of the child's family, maternal and paternal, become a stimulating influence in his life and form a fitting background to his environment. So guys, those are just some of the highlights of the book Facing on Kenya, discussing the tribal life in the Kikuyu. I'm not yet done with this book, but we will continue another video. See you in the next video, guys.